This is the classic Jack Daniels number seven, but you already knew that because everybody freaking knows that. Jasper Jack Daniels was born somewhere around the year 1850. I don't know exactly. I wasn't freaking there. And there's a couple of different stories and people get all messed up if you say the wrong year. Now, Jack wasn't real happy at home after his mother passed away, so he left in 1864, and he was taken in by Reverend Dan Call. On the Call farm, I'm sure Jack learned a lot of things, but one thing he definitely learned is how to make good whiskey from the Reverend and an enslaved man named Nathan Nearest Green. In 1866, he established his first distillery and was the master distiller until he eventually hired old Uncle Nearest from the Call Farm to take that role. In 1875, after his father passed away, he took his inheritance and he founded what we now know as the Jack Daniels Distillery along with Reverend Call. But some folks tend to get frustrated when your Reverend is giving you your preaching and your whiskey. Like we gotta keep our vices and our Lord separate. So Call quickly left the business and Jack took over as the sole owner. Jack's real fame came in 1904 when old number seven here <laughs> took gold at the World's Fair in St. Louis, Missouri, and the legend of Jack Daniels was born. Jack Daniels ran the distillery until 1907 when he decided to give it to his nephew. He didn't have any kids. Let me hand this off to my nephew, Lim Motlow, who was immediately screwed over by statewide and the nationwide prohibition and world wars. But Lim was resilient. He figured it out and Jack Daniels kept trucking along until it was sold to Brown Foreman in 1956. And of course, as luck would have it, as soon as it gets sold to a big company, their popularity really started to take off once they had the association with celebrities like Frank Sinatra, and they really took on this brand reputation as the whiskey for outlaws and rock stars. The mash bill for Jack Daniels Old Number no. 7 is 80% corn, 12% malted barley, and 8% rye. And this is most definitely not a bourbon. I mean, it is, but it isn't. Like it is a bourbon, but it isn't a bourbon. I'm extremely confused. You're confused, I'm confused, bro. Let me unpack that just a little bit. Jack Daniels uses a technique called the Lincoln County process. So after they distill this, they filter it through sugar maple charcoal before they put it in the barrel. Now their arguments are that that adds distinct characteristics of smoothness and some unique flavors to Jack Daniels. But if you're going to add flavor in any way other than through distilling or barrel aging, technically it's not considered a bourbon. And they did not want to be a bourbon. They used to be a bourbon. They sued, they said, we're not a bourbon. They actually call this a Tennessee whiskey. So very bourbon-ish but not technically a bourbon. This is still owned to this day by Brown Foreman, who owns some other popular whiskey brands like Old Forester and Woodford Reserve. Let's see what the bottle has to tell us. On the front, Jack Daniels Old Number no. 7 brand, Tennessee Whiskey Sour Mash, distilled and bottled by Jack Daniels Distillery, Lynchburg, Tennessee, USA, 80 proof. On the side, the story of Jasper Newton, Jack Daniel. Here at the Jack Daniel Distillery, we're proud to honor the independence and integrity of the man who established our distillery at the Cave Spring Hollow. True to Mr. Jack's whiskey making tradition, we still mellow our whiskey drop by drop and stand by Jack's charge. Every day we make it, we'll make it the best we can. On the other side, mellowed for smoothness drop by drop through sugar maple charcoal, matured for character in our own handcrafted barrels, tested for flavor by masters until deemed ready, awarded for quality and distinction, seven gold medals since 1904. This is probably the most iconic whiskey bottle in the world. Like this is definitely, if you think bourbon, even though technically it's not a bourbon, if I just say bourbon bottles, if I go to some AI generation tool and I say, show me a bourbon bottle, it's gonna look like this. If I say, show me a whiskey bottle, it's gonna look like this. Like this is what a whiskey bottle is supposed to look like. And so it is recognizable pretty much around the world, definitely in the United States. So you can't get much more iconic than this particular brand right here. And it's also one of the most available whiskeys in the world. If you go somewhere in the United States and they don't sell this bottle right here, I don't even know if it's a liquor store. Like they're not legally allowed to sell this proof. Would be the only reason 
they wouldn't carry this bottle. So you could get it just about anywhere and the MSRP is extremely reasonable at 20 to $25. I'm gonna try jack number seven here and judge it on six different criteria. But before I do that, it always helps me out if you'll hit the like button, maybe consider subscribing if you haven't done so already. We're also trying to take this channel to new heights and your support through patron and channel memberships here on YouTube really help us do that. If you wanna support us in that way, links to that are in the description. Also, I keep showing this one in all the reviews because it's the only shirt I have back here and we're batching these, but we have the best looking merch in the bourbon tuber game. Like this freaking horse collector shirt. It's funny. It's got a little bit of an inside joke. Like if you don't know what Blanton's are, you wouldn't know what a horse collector is. I dare you to find better merch. Just go on, find better merch, send me a link and I'll buy that. But if you can't find it, check out the merch at bruzel.com. We got quite a few really, really awesome shirt designs over there. All right, that's enough talking. Let's get to drinking. Here is my blind review of Jack Daniels number seven. For those that missed the last video, we've changed up our Brusel ranking score a little bit. There were some obvious glaring weaknesses to the way we were doing it. It was skewed toward higher proof and it just didn't hold up as we were adding more and more whiskeys to the list. So we've changed it up a little bit. I'm gonna explain it as we go through. But the first difference is that I am now doing these blinds. So you know what whiskey I'm trying, but I have no idea. So I'm just gonna pick one from the list. This one is number six, I hope. I don't think there's nine. So it's gotta be, gotta be number six. We are going to just do a two ounce pour. Now I only have two ounces. And if I need more, I'm just kind of screwed on that. Blind is the only way to truly evaluate a whiskey. You've got no chance of being swept up in marketing hype or a fancy looking bottle or your preconceived notions of what this whiskey is supposed to taste like. So we wanted to do these blind. First criteria, aroma slash taste. I'm gonna grade it from zero to 100. And this is gonna be 50% of the overall Brusel score. So this one smells a little dusty and light. There's a little bit of a youthfulness to it. And so I don't expect this one to have an extremely high proof or an older age statement. And taste wise, that's what you get. It's not bad, but it's a little bit of kind of a, a bitterness on the finish. Up front, you're hit with just not a ton. Like this is extremely low proof. I get a little oakiness, sweetness. Overall, this is not something I'm looking for in a whiskey. Like these are not just exceptional flavors that overwhelm me. And I'm not sure what on my bar this would actually be. And I need to not drink it all. I've got a lot of criteria to go through here. We're trying to be more judgmental on the flavors. So what we're doing is we start at 50 and an average whiskey, if we say something's average, then that is a 50 and we add to it from there if we believe it's above average and we subtract if it's below average. Now the problem becomes what is an average whiskey? Like what is middle of the road, just good old fashioned average whiskey and then how do you grade from there? And it's hard to tell because this one is not bad, but I don't love it. Like it's not great. So I would say to me, the whiskeys I drink, this is probably at best average in aroma and flavor to me. So I'm going to give it a 50. The next criteria we're judging on is complexity. Another component of flavor. And it's really how do the flavors evolve? And what I'm looking for is that it's got a lot of things going on and a lot of subtle flavors that I'm trying to pick out as the whiskey evolves while you're consuming it. And with this whiskey, it's not a ton of complexity. You obviously get a little evolution, but it's not great. Like it's just nothing that I would just say, okay, I need more of that. As far as an evolution goes, it's, it's again, probably average at best. There's nothing unpleasant to deduct. There's nothing that's like, oh, that's off-putting. I need to take it down a notch. So this is very much kind of middle of the road, I'm gonna give it a 50 again. And we may be just 50 all the way down the freaking list. I don't, I don't know. That's what's crazy when you don't know what it is, you can't skew it in any direction. There's nothing off-putting about it, but there's nothing remarkable about it either to me. And the next criteria is mouthfeel. We're looking for that viscosity, that thickness, 
Like how does it coat the palette? And again, this one is not terrible for low proof. It's, it's not like super thin, but it probably is just a little bit on the watery side. Overall, I'm just gonna stick it right in the middle at 50. Again, nothing off putting nothing spectacular about it. The next criteria is finish. What does it leave you with when it's all said and done? The finish on this one is not great. Like there's not a lot left. I wouldn't even call it average. Like it doesn't leave me with a whole lot. So that's where I would probably skew that one down to a 40, maybe a 45. We'll go with a 45. So just a little below average on that. Nothing really negative where we're gonna take it way down but nothing spectacular either. And we are running out of whiskey. We gotta be careful. I may have to pour like three ounce pours on these next ones. And the next two criteria require me to know what this whiskey is. So we're gonna open the card here and I am going to have a look at what I've just given basically mediocre scores to. Wow, Jack Daniels number seven. I would have thought if you would have poured Jack Daniels number seven into a Glen Cairn, I would have told you that it's Jack Daniels. I've drank so much Jack Daniels and I don't know if the foolproof before it kind of tamed it down, but I don't feel bad about these. I think that's what Jack Daniels is supposed to be. It's supposed to be just that middle of the road average thing that a lot of people can consume without being upset about it. So I don't, I don't feel bad about that score at all. So the next criteria is availability and it's gonna get a freaking hundred. Like you can't get more available than Jack Daniels old number seven. It is in literally every liquor store I have ever been in in my entire life. If they have three bottles of whiskey, one of them is Jack Daniels old number seven. Value, it looks like the MSRP on this guy, somewhere like 20 to 25 bucks on a 750 milliliter bottle, depending on where you're located. For a middle of the road bourbon, not bad in any way. To be 20, $25, that's a decent value. So it's not like exceptional. You're not getting just a great Glencairn worthy sipper at 20, 25 bucks. And I think there's a few out there. It's gonna be an above average value statement. I would probably put that value at about a 75. And that gives Jack Daniels a bruisal score of 52.25. But we'll continue adding these as we go. Like that's pretty much just an average score, like a pretty good bottle that's regularly available, which is I think score wise exactly where this should be. Y'all let me know in the comments, like does 52, like roughly about an average bottle of whiskey, but with some availability points kind of boosting it up above 50. Do you think that's exactly where Jack Daniels should be? Are we starting to kind of dial in this scoring system to where it makes sense. And I like kind of those decimal points where it's got 0.25 and so we can really, everything won't just end up tied in the freaking middle. I'm liking the scoring system so far, but if it starts to struggle, we'll adjust. Like what we want long-term is something really cool and useful that'll work for adding a hundred or a thousand whiskeys to the list. So y'all let me know your thoughts on it so far.